Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for finding the time to join this webinar on what I know is a very hot evening. It's very good of you as we explore the subject of wokeism and particularly uh, wokeism when it comes to schools and independent schools. Um, I'm going to speak tonight for around 30 minutes, something like that, um, and then I welcome any questions to come through on the Q&A function through Teams. Um, do type them as they come to you. Uh, they won't necessarily appear. The uh, back office team will release some of those questions at the end of the at the end of the webinar for me to pick up through the published channel. So uh, do feel free to type them, but don't don't worry if they don't necessarily appear uh, in prose on the screen in front of you. Um, and I hope very much that what I have to say at least um, allows for some really lively thought. Um, and discussion around what is a uh, particularly contentious and sensitive issue at the moment. So I'm sure there are some of you on this webinar who will be particularly surprised to hear that I can't really remember the 1980s. I was alive, of course, but I was a small child for the vast majority of it. However, what I can recall is the prevailing conservatism, social conservatism of the time. I have small recollections of what these days seem like a very different era indeed. To give but one example, in the 1980s, only one in 10 of the public approved of same sex relationships, one in 10. And that, of course, was just 30 years ago. Given that statistic, it's perhaps less of a surprise that recent media coverage of my own announcement when I decided to be honest with my students as to my own sexuality caused quite the stir that it did. Back in the 1980s, those fighting for social change and a movement for greater equality were quickly politicised into what was then given a number of derogatory terms, including the catch-all phrase, the loony lefties, which some of you may recall. These were people who, whatever their political beliefs may have been, were really just trying to argue for a world where abject racism, homophobia, misogynism and disabilist language did not characterise the social conversation. A challenge to heteronormative white pub banter across Britain, challenging that what was being said was not funny, but was actually unkind, degrading and hurtful. Challenging a world where watching Alf Garnet broadcast on national television and regaling discriminatory jokes should not be seen as an amusing pastime but as a national wrong. Some of you may recall how quick society was to deride the Greater London Council in the 1980s for supporting those campaigning for gay and lesbian rights and also for challenging racial inequality. The lefty loonies were at work again. And yet, of course, within just 15 years, these issues became mainstream in national thinking. I do remember the 1990s having been at secondary school at the time, I remember the fear of that landslide victory of Tony Blair's government and the ensuing outcry that society was pushing for social reform and liberalism beyond what was acceptable. By this time, the terminology has moved on. It was no longer termed the loony lefties, but the phrase one would hear is, it's political correctness gone mad. I remember that phrase or forms of it being repeated endlessly in my youth. Madness was now what it was. The madness of the people trying to end Section 28, that legislation that made it impossible for teachers to even teach about homosexuality in school, and that in my view damaged a generation of LGBTQ plus young people. I recall being told early in my teaching career how Section 28 could only be seen as a good thing because it protected the young from sexual deviance. I was also told unequivocally by a history teacher in that school that colonialism was a good thing and should be taught through the lens of celebration and not critical analysis. And by the way, that was all less than 20 years ago. But of course, it was the madness of the politically correct lobby that fought for the age of consent to be made equal and who paved the way for a change in social thinking, which quickly became the norm, not, not least under Cameron's government, who then went on to legislate for same-sex marriage and civil partnership. And surely it was madness for commissioning the McPherson report 
that ended up identifying institutional racism in the Metropolitan Police. Political correctness gone mad. Indeed, when I was researching this webinar, I was reminded of a clip where Bernard Manning is interviewed by Mrs Merton in 1998, so less than 25 years ago. And there on national television, we witness an audience in the late 90s laughing at Bernard Manning admitting to his racist ideology and freely delivering jokes designed to humiliate and belittle the different. It's worth watching it, not least because you can see a glimmer of change in that audience. It's a society that's just starting to feel torn as to how to respond to what was increasingly considered ill at odds with a slow emerging, more inclusive narrative. And there in that same interview, sitting on the sofa is an evidently outraged Richard Wilson, tellingly unable to say what he really thinks and using wit and humour as best he can to fight it. It really is quite fascinating to watch it. It's a microcosm of, of society as it was in the late 90s. But I don't see in that clip or think that there is a fight going on for political correctness that was mad. I see it as a necessary fight for what was and is right. None of what I've just said is, is meant to be a political statement. It really isn't. It's about understanding and showcasing patterns in our social history. A pattern amongst our British society that demonstrates an instinctive fear for social reform and for change. A deep seated fear, I would argue, for moving away from tribal similarity towards a recognition that in difference and diversity, there can be an intrinsic good and that equality is a fundamental right. A pattern that showcases a natural conservatism not to engage in healthy and objective debate but rather to take the easier path and find ways of collectively condemning and ridiculing progressive thinkers through derogatory terminology and labelling them as a social ill. When today we look back at the views and opinions of the loony left or the madness of political correctness in the 1990s, we don't condemn those ideas of equality as being extreme. Far from it, we see them as being humane, a logical and necessary evolution. And yet our history shows that at the time, society is quick to twist the words, describing social reform into being a negative, something to be scorned at, to be wary of and to be met with entrenchment. They're loonies or they're mad or we need to fight a war, a war on wokeism. And today it's all about wokeism. And in some ways it really is no different just at another stage of the ongoing evolution of social values, another term, another plight. However, in many ways, it does feel different because the language has been accelerated. To be, to be declaring a war is undoubtedly more visceral than the language used in previous decades. No longer is it described as an eccentricity of thought or a stupidity of thinking. Now it's something that needs to be conquered something that needs to be beaten down and destroyed. It does feel that this time it's even more bitter, even more divisive, and risks our society become riven into immovable positions at different ends of a spectrum. And I believe this shift can be explained through some key differences in the world today in the fight against social progression in the 21st century Britain. Firstly, Today, we live in a world where social media and globalisation can stoke the fire of discontent in an instant and on both sides of the thinking. This is coupled to a pandemic where people have been forced to shield behind the wall of a computer and the an anonymity of a keyboard. Our world has become much less an exchange of views, a healthy debate and more of an, an anonymised mudslinging match of increasingly entrenched positions of outrage. I want to argue that educators and schools have a fundamental role in challenging this dangerous societal position, but to do so will demand creativity and imagination from its leaders. Secondly, we have a world where divisions are arguably deeper and more complex than ever before. We see a new and emerging generation that is more radical than we have seen before, for whom issues of gender, sex and race are woven together with questions of wealth, power and privilege. On the other end of the spectrum, we've seen this mobilising a demographic who have felt reinvigorated by a world order that showcased the populist right. An, an era of Trump, of Putin, of Bolsonaro, 
a global stage that has allowed those who never really believed in the march of 80s and 90s liberalism, but kept their head down and got through it, only now to refind their voice. The basic liberal consensus has been challenged by nationalistic rhetoric and fueled by social media furore. It's the perfect storm, Twitter or otherwise, the zealousness on both sides, and one which very sadly, in my view, has replaced the art of debate with the ignominy of hatred and rhetoric. Taken purely on face value, there should be absolutely nothing to denigrate in the word woke. Although it took until 2017 to appear in the Oxford Dictionary, its definition is harmless enough to be aware and alert to social injustice and issues of discrimination. That's it. Who could possibly think badly of that? But that in a survey of recent survey, 59% of our population didn't know what being woke actually meant tells its own story. Perhaps people don't really want to know what it means because it suits their purposes to use the word as a catch-all for perceived malevolence of a growing and ostensibly threatening liberal agenda. Wokeness has, of course, been morphed into a far broader agenda and an agenda that some find intrinsically threatening to them and their values. With its origins directly in the struggle for racial equality, first cited in 1962 in the New York Times on a piece describing words you might hear in Harlem, its manifestation through the Black Lives Matter movement through the hashtag Stay Woke seemed to stir an inner threat amongst a portion of our society. And this threat and fear led to the inevitable, I suppose, hijacking of the word for reasons of mockery. It's become used now not as a call for racial equality, but transformed by the right wing press into a term that's given to laugh at a generation of people who are ill at ease with the world they inhabit, a world that these people believe is right only because it's what they know. But the reality is that there has to be a place for ongoing social progression and evolution. The world is just not where it needs to be yet. There are certain things, in my view, where there can be no real debate. It cannot be seen as anything but unjust that four in five trans people have been the victim of hate crime. That young black men in London are something like 20 times more likely to be stopped and searched. That black women are four times more likely to die in childbirth. The recent exposure by everyone's invited and then subsequently by the report on Ofsted that we received this week exposes deep horrors at the heart of our education system. These are not fanciful expressions of liberalism that need good spirited debate. These are wrongs that need addressing. Quite literally, the woke agenda triggered through the Black Lives Matter last summer served as a wake up call for St Dunstan's. It awoke a need to take stock, to reflect and to recognise that we can absolutely do better in our celebration here at school of racial diversity and assurance of a truly anti-racist culture. For too long, schools have become conservative to the point that they have stifled their ability to think creatively about a genuinely inclusive agenda that seeks not just to include diversity, but to promote it, not just to endorse equality, but to live and breathe it. But the easier route, as history teaches, is to present a narrative that speaks wrongly of this demand. And so we see the rise of the anti-wokers. Lawrence Fox argues that wokists are themselves fundamentally racist because identity politics is racist on all sides. Piers Morgan rallies against the hysterically woke liberals. Andrew Neil introduces Woke Watch, the common sense group materialises. The backlash begins against what is quickly framed as an unstoppable threat to the nation's values. The whole notion becomes twisted away from a fight for a more equal world and is described as a signifier of pretentiousness and cultural elitism epitomised by the cosmopolitan liberal. Wokeism is termed cancel culture, a movement that seeks only superficially to stand for social justice, but is in reality more interested in obliterating the past and ironically conformity of thinking. And so, as with all points of divergence, we start to actually see that the commonality becomes points of similarity. 
And it starts to get particularly emotive when the attack, as it is seen, targets those values and symbols at the core of our national identity. The National Trust, Churchill, Cecil Rhodes. These flashpoints bring out the very worst of the debate as they tap into a deep sense of threat to national identity on the one side of the fence, which of course must be protected at all costs, and as a veneer for underlying colonial values that must be exposed on the other. And such is the visceral nature of that debate and such is the cunning of social media and data tracking that we move into an era, era where there is no longer a place for the traditional debate and acceptance of disagreement. In the words of Andrew Neil, you are, quote, brought before the court of woke opinion. You should lose your job. You should certainly wear sackcloth and ashes and your name should be dragged through the social media sphere. You should be forced to apologise, but we may not accept your apology. The wokists are couched as lifestyle prefects and the world is quickly positioned. The word, sorry, is quickly positioned as a slur rather than something to discuss. Specifics are put under the microscope by the right wing press that is designed to inflame. The idea of a cosmopolitan elite sipping on their vegan lattes and talking about unisex toilets, statues and pronouns. Perhaps one of the best examples of this torture of the national soul is the report of, is the report of Corinne Fowler, the professor of postcolonial literature at Leicester, whose report who reported for the National Trust on detailed links between historic slavery and colonialism, capturing around 100 properties in total. The report was absolutely attacked by the right-wing media. The National Trust tried their best by saying that it helped contextualize history of places in our care, helping the public to question assumptions about the past, but it just wasn't going to wash. The Daily Mail described Professor Fowler as, and I quote, the academic signed up by the National Trust to lecture us on the evils behind our most glorious estates. But behind much of this, there is also a truth, in my view. There is a very real risk to the woke brand. It's the risk of outrage and indignation taking over to the point of recalcitrance. I cannot see that there is anything to be gained in creating such polarization of views, that we reach a point where never the twain shall meet. And this is where social media can be so unhelpful, fueling the flames of extremism when extremism on either side is so unnecessary. Let's take one particularly thorny debate, the restaurant of the Tate Britain. In the 1920s, a young artist was commissioned to compose a frieze around the restaurant. Rex Whistler set about his task with great enthusiasm and created an exquisite piece of art. Entitled The Expedition in the Pursuit of Rare Meats, it was termed at the time the most amusing room in Britain. Amusing for the audience of its day, maybe, but for the discerning observer, we also see racism at work. Racist caricatures at their worst, showing a young black boy chained by the neck. Upsetting, racist, yes and yes. Yet here we have in miniature one of the great conundrums of the modern day. An exquisite, wonderful piece of art. An object that cannot be removed. And a racist mural. The restaurant looks certain to close and that may be the answer. But I would be very sorry if that decision did not come about out of an informed, objective and open debate. A debate where people are encouraged to disagree, to listen to one another and to reach a mutually agreeable conclusion. The alternative is that outrage culture takes over and replaces dialogue. And it's in this arena that I believe firmly education must step up. We must start having meaningful dialogue with the young about issues that matter to them. At St Dunstan's, like many schools, we've been through three momentous events over the last 15 months. The Black Lives Matter movement of summer 2020, a global pandemic, and then most recently, the Everyone's Invited movement. I realised that as a consequence, what we were seeing was an increased and worrying disconnect between the young and their teachers, triggered by a societal backlash 
that uh, characterized the aftermath of the crisis. I was concerned by an increasingly unhealthy moral outrage amongst the children. Reports started to reach me of sentiments such as, I hate him because he supports Brexit, or I won't speak to her anymore because she says she likes Boris Johnson. Children from an early stage being preconditioned, bombarded by messaging on social media platforms, conditioning, conditioning them not into open-minded, curious, discursive young adults, but increasingly becoming a closed book on such topics, quick to judge and not quick to listen. Young people for whom wokeness means absolutes and judgment. And we have an imperative not to allow this culture to leach into our schools. What will, what will society become if we have entrenchment to the point of hatred? Surely therein lies political extremism and ideological narrow-mindedness that history teaches us only too well is at best unhealthy and at worst downright dangerous. Its immediate concern in schools is that the community becomes on edge. We demand, rightly, a, di a greater diversity to the curriculum. But then some teachers become scared of how to teach racially diverse material, fearful of putting a foot wrong, worried of being accused of microaggressions or being homophobic or transphobic or misogynistic. A lack of open dialogue around such matters between students and teachers risks us not moving forwards. And we need to take everyone with us on this journey to ensuring an equal society and one that genuinely cherishes diversity. I established the St Dunstan's diapason here to take a small step towards countering this problem. The diapason is formulated of children and teachers working in partnership on issues of equality and diversity. There are five strands to the diapason with student and staff partnerships considering areas that have particular meaning for them and for society. Sexual identity, sex and gender, religion and belief, disability and race. The group of teachers and students set about discussing, researching and debating before formulating a joint strategy for how the whole organisation can do better at promoting diversity and ensuring a culture of genuine equality. We will see how it goes. We've only had one meeting, but even through that limited exposure, I can see just how important it is for the dialogue, for children to be able to express their frustrations with the world and the generation they increasingly see as being their adversary rather than their co-conspirator. And for teachers to be able to express to them their concerns and also to be able to offer context and history behind why some people may think and act the way they do. One girl in that meeting casually remarked to me, I didn't realise there were issues for LGBTQ rights in schools in the 1990s. This is why whatever views any of us may have on how we treat the statues and buildings that represent our colonial past, first and foremost, we must have debate, healthy debate and discussion in schools about these challenging issues. This is the only way that we will diffuse what has the potential to be one of the greatest toxic conflicts of our generation. If we don't bring children into the conversation, they will seek to insist ever more on self-generated agency. If we don't discuss the risks and complexities of taking gender realigning medication at a young age, if we don't discuss the controversy of Whistler's mural in Tate Britain, if we don't discuss the options for Oriel College, we miss our primary purpose as educators, to make children think about values, to help them develop their own individual beliefs and views in a safe, nurturing and stimulating environment. After all, it is they who will go on to shape the world and society's occupation of it. And in the absence of doing so, we will force the hand of entrenchment ever deeper and ever younger. We will create a generation who enter the world predetermined to be outraged, lacking humour and open mindedness. It was once said that we cannot escape the dragnet of history. To shy away from our history and the teaching of the young is to protect them from a reality from which they have an obligation to learn and from which to draw strength. 
And central to this is the desperate need for curriculum reform. We have to create in our schools the opportunity for such discussions to take place. We have an obligation to make space for this dialogue, but to do so requires a rethinking of our priorities. What do we really want to achieve from our education and our assessment? This conveyor belt approach to assessment with outdated GCSEs being the pot of gold at the end of the educational rainbow steals quality education away from our young people. They are immersed in a schooling that prioritises exam technique and the parceling up of bundles of knowledge ready for the regurgitation exam hall and sidelines the important conversations. Does it really take everyone's invited to expose the fact that we have a completely out of date RSE policy in this country that's not fit for purpose. It's like saying that as a nation, once we force fed our children a diet of basic knowledge and exam skills, we'll then, as an afterthought, shoehorn in conversations about self, relationships and society. We have to turn education on its head. We need to be educating for values first and foremost, seeking through imaginative curricular and co-curricular provision to develop young people who are open minded to debate, well informed about history and understand the context and importance of different points of view. Young people who can think critically and work through problems, not attack them with righteous indignation. And independent schools are particularly well positioned to trailblaze this shift, not least because they have the independence to make brave choices. From September at St Dunstan's, we'll be teaching a newly curated strand to our curriculum. It's called the Stuart curriculum. It's a programme of study that's designed to open up society's can of worms, to get it out in the open, to talk about the knotty issues that we know our youngsters are exposed to, but otherwise dare not be raised. Of course, we must train our teachers to feel confident and comfortable in facilitating this debate. But without it, we're doing an enormous disservice to our young people. And independent schools must also confront their own past. For many, holding on to a conservative doctrine feels the safest and easiest way to continue. Empowering children to have a voice, to speak out, to debate difficult issues and to confront challenge. It's not easy. It's not always comfortable, but it doesn't mean to say that it's the wrong thing to do. My strong view is that we need to move away from the terminology and the labelling. And certainly let's move away from the vitriol. That's it. Let's have healthy discussion and debate. Let's go back to the origin of enlightened thinking that has characterised our country for so many hundreds of years. Let's take back the joy in the difference of opinion, in discussing it and finding compromise. And let's also accept that there are undeniable injustices that are still present in our world and accept that it's OK to offer challenge to that. Take a look back in history and look at all the progressive thinking that has by its very nature had to be different to challenge convention. It has to be different to, uh, to, qu to question those convention values. Just look at those woke, mad, loony suffragettes, those woke, mad, loony civil rights campaigners. We need to have an open mind to challenge and change and frame it in discussion and debate. We must not allow ourselves to drift into a society where the answer lies in homogenising thinking. The current tendency by our government of ensuring the guardianship of our heritage is fulfilled by like minded thinkers runs a real risk of state control of art and in so doing freedom and expression. In diversity of opinion and ideas, all organisations draw strength and health. As Gormley says, we must avoid a Maoist situation where art represents state policy. Let's not see woke as a dirty word used to describe a liberal elite, but as the latest in a series of open doors. Open doors that invite difficult questions, debate and uncomfortable truths. The answer is not to slam the door shut and dig in to respective positions of conflict. We don't need more wars. A war on woke is the last thing we need. Dialogue is what we need and healthy educational values. So should we pull down the statue of Cecil Rhodes Memorial College? 
do you know I'm not set on the outcome really I'm much more interested in the process of debate that gets us to that point and that's why I quite like Gormley's idea of turning the whole statue around for it just might represent something deeper a turning around of the whole debate on woke an acknowledgement that is not binary values conflict but a challenging shift in societal thinking for which there is not necessarily the right answer but over which there is certainly a conversation to be had and certainly not a war to be waged thank you very much for listening <laughs>